Welcome, everyone, and thank you for attending this webinar. I'm David Shaw, the publishing director of Family Business Magazine. I hope that you, your family members, and your employees are and remain in good health. Our topic today is disruption, and this last year has been filled with disruption. But even though the pandemic has had major impacts on the stock market, interest rates, commercial real estate, and estate planning, disruption has always been a factor in our lives and our businesses. Creative destruction is really at the root of capitalism. In today's webinar, we'll look at different types of disruption and then look at how to better protect your business and your family from that disruption. But before we get started, there's some quick housekeeping details I'd like to go through. We welcome your questions and especially your thoughts and comments throughout the session. Use the question box to the left of the video screen there and, uh, and, and enter your questions as they occur to you. We'll go for no more than 60 minutes today and get to as many questions and comments as we can. And yes, the presentation you see will be emailed to you after the webinar. So joining me today, I'm really pleased, are Brian Bissell and Caleb Silsby. Brian is a senior vice president and client advisor at the Orange County office, Orange County, California office of Whittier Trust. He provides a full range of wealth management, family office and trust services and has experience working with multiple generations of high net worth families. Caleb is the chief chief portfolio manager for Whittier Trust. He's been with the company since 2006. And in addition to being co-manager of the Whittier Trust fixed income team, he's a member of the investment committee and is responsible for analyzing energy companies for core equity strategies. Caleb manages portfolios for high net worth clients, foundations, and endowments. So with that introduction, I'd like to turn it over to Caleb. Caleb? David, thank you so much, and good morning and good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast. Today, we are, we're talking about how to protect your family business in a time of disruption. We, we start out with a slide of a picture of 1990. So let's, let's put this presentation into perspective. We're going back 30 years here. So in 1990, you may have had a 9 a.m. call. You check your pager, you pull out your briefcase, and you have a pen and, and maybe some paper and a Rolodex. Think about 2020, just in that same hour time slot, you can be, you can check your email on your phone, you could be on a Zoom call, a video conference call like we're, we're presenting today. You could have wireless headphones, you can adjust your thermostat, pay your credit card bill, you can de deposit a check, check in for a flight. And during this presentation, if you really wanted to, you could probably actually buy a Tesla Model 3 with Bitcoin. So the world has, as David said, has, has seen a lot of changes and disruption over the, over the past 30 years. The past 12 months in particular, we saw significant disruption, not only in our daily lives, but also in the business world. And so last year, you, you saw that the, the stock market was surprisingly strong uh, in terms of generating 18.4% returns for the S&P 500 in 2020. That, those returns were not equal, right? The, the airlines, energy companies, the, if you were in hospitality, there were a number of industries and sectors that, that, that not only lost money last year, but saw a meaningful um, decline in value in, in publicly traded stocks as well. If you look at the technology stocks, they were up over 43% last year. So a lot of the market return was driven by technology. To put that further in perspective, you can see in this chart in, in 1980 on the left-hand side, this is a two columns. Blue column is the weighting in the S&P 500 of technology and communication stocks. The green bar is the weighting in the S&P 500 of industrial, material, and energy stocks. So basically comparing the technology weighting and how big of an impact that has on, on the stock market versus the industrial economy. In the 1980, technology and communications around 12%, more than 50% was in the industrial economy. By the time we got to 2000, the year of the dot-com bubble, you saw that the weighting of, of technology and communications was approaching almost a third. It was around 26, 27% 
it had exceeded the industrial economy. And then look at 2020, where nearly 40% of the index is in communication services and technology, and, and only 12 or 13% is in materials and energy. So this is just an incredible shift. Uh, Andreessen Horowitz put out in you know, about a decade ago that they said that software is eating the world, and it really is happening in terms of index weightings. So if software is eating the world, the world is eating pizza, right? This is just a funny slide we put together, but uh, who would have believed that Domino's Pizza has outperformed Google stock since Google's IPO? That's one that you can probably take to dinner tonight that, that somebody else probably would not know. And so is it, is it really that the world eating more pizza today? I mean, that's, that's part of it, but the biggest factor is that Domino's adjusted to this disruption. Domino's became a technology business. If you have the Domino's app on your phone, which if you have kids between the ages of you know, three and 12, you probably do, uh, it's easy to order a, a Domino's pizza with the click of a button. You can track the pizza. You can see where it is in terms of the delivery process. You're not eating cold pizza. And uh, so Domino's is one example of a company that's it's not in the technology sector, but it's really become a technology business. And so on that previous slide where we talked about you know, nearly 40% of the index is in technology, uh, if you extend that and you say, let's look at companies that are actually technically consumer discretion companies like Amazon or a Domino's Pizza, if you look at FinTech companies or healthcare IT companies, you get to more than half of the S&P 500, half of the index is really driven by technology. So virtually every business is in some way becoming a technology business. So not only is technology disrupting the market, but we would, we'll talk about another factor here where companies are staying unprofitable for longer periods of time. And we have a chart here that shows that nearly 80% of companies that are going private right now, or sorry, going public right now, are unprofitable. So they're staying, they're staying private longer and they're unprofitable for longer periods of time. Contrast that to the 1980s, that was sort of a you know, more industrial-based economy and industrial model uh, market. At that time, if you had a new business idea and you wanted to disrupt uh, an industry leader, you would go to the bank and you would say, I have a business idea, I want a loan, and the bank underwriter would come back to you and say, well, when are we going to get paid back on the loan? Is it going to be 12 months, 18 months? Show us the business model. Show us when you're cash flow positive. We want to know when we're going to get paid back. Today, it's if you have a business idea, you go to venture capitalists, and you go to private equity funds, and you say, we're not going to be profitable for a decade. But when we get there, we're going to have such scale that we are going to completely disrupt this industry and we are going to take a huge share of profits. So if you look at the, the largest companies, you know, the Googles and Facebooks uh, of the world, they, they didn't even exist 20 years ago. And now they are dominant players and have enormous profitability. Think about companies like Uber and Netflix that were unprofitable for so long. Even, even Amazon was unprofitable for so long. And yet when they achieve scale, they can be extremely profitable. And so it, it's a different landscape than it was 30 years ago. Companies can stay private longer and they can be unprofitable for much longer, which means that they can disrupt incumbents without relying on internal cash flows. They can give away free services until they achieve scale and then they can completely disrupt. So if you're looking at this chart and you're thinking, wow, this looks like the dot-com bubble, let's just go through a simple case study here. So in 2011, you had two companies, Microsoft and IBM. They were trading at almost the exact same market value, market capitalization. So. Microsoft at 218 billion, IBM at 220 billion. The, the valuation very similar as well. So Microsoft with a eight times PE ratio and IBM with a 10 times PE ratio. 
and look at what has happened over the last decade. Microsoft went from the 200 billion to now 1.7 trillion. IBM went from the same 200 billion to now around 100 billion. And this has really occurred because Microsoft is a dominant player in the cloud, IBM a player in legacy servers. You've seen this bifurcation, you've seen this split. Microsoft has adapted and the point of this case study is that valuation is important. Even more important is preparing for disruption and being ahead of the disruption. So we talk about how every business is a technology business. We talked about the cloud with Microsoft. We now highlight a company called NVIDIA, where you can see two columns here. This is revenue for the, for the company. And, the orange is, is gaming revenue, which during the pandemic, you probably have family members that have been doing more gaming than they've ever done before. And, uh, and so gaming revenue has done very well. Data center has absolutely boomed. There's been this boom within the crisis. And so data center revenue has increased 3X. And uh, so, we think about the cloud and the dominant players, but there's also companies that are going to service the cloud. And in this case, the GPUs for the cloud. But every business is in technology. We talked about that. Let's look at another example. Even real estate is in technology. Uh, so we highlight Invitation Homes here, which is a company that owns single family homes and then rents those out. And look at this market. So. 16.2 million units are owned by individuals, mom and pops, and, uh, and the institutional market has not been able to play in this space. So think about the scale there. If you own an apartment complex that has 10 units and you need to replace the roof, you replace one roof and that goes across all 10 paying rent renters. If you have 10 single family homes, you need to replace 10 roofs. So it, you don't get the same scale in the single family market. Uh, plus just in terms of paperwork, titling, all of that, it's always been a much more difficult space for institutional investors to, to play in. But now you're, you're, you're seeing significant growth there and technology is enabling that. The technology around the paperwork is so much easier and more streamlined and quicker. The technology around monitoring the home you know, what's the electricity usage? What's the water usage? So it's shifting this market as well, where individual uh, investors in single family homes are going to compete more and more with institutional investors there. So not only is real estate in technology, but technology is in real estate. So Amazon over the last year has increased the amount of industrial space that they own by 42%. They've increased the amount they leased by a significant amount as well. So uh, Amazon is disrupting the industrial uh, real estate business as well. And then this this is a favorite slide from a presentation we gave a year ago at this time. I don't know if you can see the small print on the right hand side, but it actually talks about the uh, March Madness, the NCAA basketball tournament being canceled around this time last year because of coronavirus. And we talked about what changes in the libraries. So uh, the picture on the left, an empty freeway. This is the 110 going into downtown Los Angeles. There's one car on the road during daylight. Is, is that the new future? No, you already know that. You've already seen traffic pick up, even though we're not fully open yet. And then the picture on the right, you know, near hundreds of people in close proximity while the news is saying that coronavirus is spreading and, and the NCAA tournament is canceled and Kenny Chesney's concert is being canceled. So humans are social animals and they will go back to, to, uh, to being you know, relatively normal, but there are some, some lasting changes that will endure here. And we really highlighted that it's the acceleration of these existing trends that uh, will continue on for a long period of time. So hopefully uh, set the stage that, that we are in a time of disruption. David mentioned we're always in a time of disruption. We are in a heightened time of disruption right now. 
that uh, technology is everywhere. Virtually every business is in technology. That software is eating the world. Uh, and that not only is technology everywhere, but the market weightings reflect that. So if you look at the S&P 500, most companies in there have, are, are connected to technology in many ways. Um, we highlighted that companies that adapt, like Microsoft, can thrive in this world of disruption. And uh, we highlighted that disruption will continue, and it will continue really for three uh, primary reasons. One is that technology uh, will continue to be very disruptive. Second is that companies will stay private longer. And when they stay private, you know, imagine every time you want to invest in a public company, you're, you're buying somebody's shares that somebody else is selling. If you invest in a private company, most of the time you're actually giving money to that, to that business so that they can grow. Uh, each time SpaceX raise, you know, allows investors to invest in SpaceX, which there is huge demand for, when investors invest in SpaceX, they're generally giving money to the company, and the company has uh, an even stronger balance sheet. So companies are staying private longer, and companies can be unprofitable for much longer. So those three primary reasons uh, are, gonna, are, are reasons why disruption will continue, and it will continue at a heightened rate. And then finally, we highlighted that valuation is important, but uh, adjusting to disruption is even more important. So I'll turn it over to Brian to talk about specifically how you can protect your family business in this, this time of disruption. David, I, I think you're muted. You know, Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. It was a quick question from the audience and uh, for you, Caleb. Uh, yeah. You talk about how an existing, uh, how how companies can go longer, obviously, without turning a profit. How can existing players it, compete with that disruptive effect of long-term unprofitability? I think that's a fantastic segue to Brian's section on how how to adjust. We actually have four four ways to adjust to that. I won't steal Brian's thunder. If uh, David, if I if Brian and, and and I have not answered the question at the end of the presentation, please come back to us, and I will certainly answer it then. Will do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Caleb. Um, you know when I thought about our audience today, I thought about all the family business owners and different types of businesses that, that can be out there and, and the different industries you're in and this topic of disruption, you, you really can't escape disruption. You know, the, the, there's a lot of disruptive forces and we're at a time where there's a multitude of disrupt, disrupting forces that are presenting themselves, but there's also a bunch that we haven't even thought about yet. So it's a, it's a really interesting topic and how to protect your family business to survive, um, hopefully for another 100, 150 years is, is the goal to, to help it transition through the generations and remain um, strong. And and so we, we devised six ways to protect your family business from disruption. You can, you can prepare for it, um, which you know, make some strategic moves today, in increasing your ability to adapt to the changing, uh, the, the change that your industry might be experiencing. Um, diverse, diversified. I, I, I kind of see this in, in two different ways. One, diversify internally. You know, maybe, maybe increase a, a, a product line or service, something that is just a little different than your primary business, but it, it may give you a. Um, an option down the road should you need to shift um, and and diversification also looking outward uh, if if there's an ability to invest in high quality companies outside of your your own primary business may create um, you know a a lifeline should the industry shift on you and if you're able to either take um, Take take some, some uh, monetize the business in a way you know maybe pull pull some uh, equity out and, and reinvest in a diversified basket of portfolios. Um, 
you can you can own names like like Domino's and Amazon and Microsoft and and can create a lifeline for you uh, should you need it. Uh, taking advantage of strong markets and monetizing, we're we're near all time highs on the stock market, and and the last decade has been great for for many industries. We had that big hiccup occur during the the pandemic and the economic shutdown, but we're it came roaring back. We're we're near all time highs. So depending on your own family business and what industry you're in, could be a great time to monetize, and um, you know either sell the family business or just maybe just a portion of it. Maybe you sell uh, part of the real estate that your business is operating on just to create some liquidity and and have the ability to reinvest and 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 diversify, like we we just talked about. Thinking about debt location, um, with the ever increasing uncertainty of the future and, and these disrupting factors creeping in, um, we, we think that with interest rates at historic lows, this could be a great time to to maybe pull some equity out um, and, and share some of this risk with, with a bank or other lender. Um, you may be an expert in all things relating to your business and your industry, but it can be really helpful to build a team that can assist in the transition, succession planning, and estate planning. Um, as we'll get into more detail in future slides, you know, estate taxes and changing tax laws will always be a disruption that family businesses face. It's something that differentiates from a public company that, you know, Amazon doesn't have to worry about paying an estate tax every time they shift to to a successive generation. And that brings us to the taking advantage of the Nevada advantage. You know, the, the certain states present great opportunities to weather the storm of, of this big tax bill looming on the horizon from both an income tax perspective and an estate tax perspective. So on the next slide, um, getting into more deep detail about preparing for disruption, you know, this th th there's four four ways that we see. You, you can be an early adopter, so you can be a disruptor yourself. And if you can't beat them, join them. You know, you th there's opportunities for strategic acquisitions. You can merge with a, a competitor to to strengthen your position within the industry, um, and building a strong brand. That the customer loyalty that you can garner from from building a strong brand can buy you the time to adapt to a changing industry and, and survive a disrupting force. This example we're using here shows Procter and Gamble utilizing the uh, TikTok platform to market their paper towels. And you know, I don't think Mr. Gamble ever envisioned using a viral dance craze to uh, to market his products to the masses. But it's a great example of how a company that's not really known for innovation and technology um, didn't have to create the platform themselves. You just have to be agile enough to adapt and, and take advantage of those opportunities that maybe some of these disruptors bring to the surface. So they aren't, disruption can carry a, a negative connotation because it disrupts the, the status quo and, and can make things difficult. But I think it can also be viewed as, um, creating opportunity. And this is a great example of, of Procter Gamble jump, jumping on uh, on that TikTok bandwagon and, and making the most of it. On the next page. Yeah, Brian, why don't we just pause there for a second and David, please chime in. But th this this hopefully answers the question that, uh, that was written in. So you, you basically you can be an early adopter, right? You can you can you can see the change coming and you can be an industry leader in, in terms of taking on that change. And then you can uh, you can see others that are are successful and you can uh, tag along with them. So if you can't beat them, join them. And I think Brian's example of, of you know, the bounty uh, dance competition on TikTok is an incredible example of that. Uh, and, and then Brian highlighted it, right? But the hard decision to disrupt yourself. You, you may have a good cash flowing business but if you see a disruptor who is unprofitable, you know you can't discount them just because they're unprofitable. Uh, I, I hope that we've made that that impression stick that that companies can compete and be unprofitable for a long period of time, and then when they achieve scale, they can disrupt. So you may have to disrupt yourself 
uh, and Brian highlighted, maybe it's a joint venture that you engage in that could cannibalize, um, but will ultimately, um, you know, lead to protecting your your profit interest. A good example there, another good example along the lines of Procter and Gamble, is uh, when they were they were they actually had a meeting where um, one of the engineers and and products marketers came to the table and said we should do a direct to consumer razor blade for Gillette. And the, the committee sat around the table and said, that's, you know, it's a great idea. It's going to be a home run. We can't do it because it's going to upset one of our, our key clients. It's going to upset uh, the retailers like the Walmarts and the targets who, you know, they want to draw people into the stores. And if we're going around them and we are selling, you know, razors directly to consumers and mailing them to their mailbox, People aren't going to go, go into Walmart, and that's going to upset our, our key client. You know what happened next, right? Dollar Shave Club came around and disrupted Gillette. So Gillette had, had the vision. They thought about disrupting themselves, but they weren't willing to make that, that move because it would be too painful, you know, for a very good reason. It would just be too painful for one of their key clients. And, but with hindsight, you know, while all those those were good points in the in the boardroom, they saw the they they knew the writing on the wall, and they should have made the very very difficult decision. So, um, and then finally, Brian highlighted building a brand. Right, if you have a brand that's just so strong that people are loyal, um, that's that's an Apple example, right? Apple um, has created that network and that brand that even though technology keeps moving. And they may not have the best technology at all times. They have a very, very loyal following. Yes, and the Dollar Shave Club story resonates because with examples of self-disruption in family businesses, it can oftentimes be a generational conflict uh, where a younger generation wants to try new things or disrupt the business and older generations don't. Do you have any insights into that kind of that kind of special familial tension? Yeah, yeah. And, and Brian highlighted it, right? But bringing in, having the right team there. So you don't want to make it a uh, personal, you know, uh, my grandmother or grandfather doesn't trust me or my mom or dad doesn't trust me. You want to make it a business decision, separate business from family. And uh, while we are you know, imploring you to consider disrupting yourself, uh, there are um, you know, nine out of 10 venture companies that are invested in fail. And so there are many attempts to disrupt yourself or to change things that, that end up failing. Um, so by no means is, you know, G1 wrong in setting the bar high for, for change. Um, but it's a balance. You know, I think G1 or G2, whoever's running the business and thinking about passing it on to the next generation, they have to be thinking about, they have to be very open-minded to new ideas and new concepts. And G2, G3, whoever's, you know, taking the reins next has to understand that the previous generation has a lot of experience and they've seen the, the challenges and, and turmoil that can come from unnecessary change or unproductive change. And uh, so it, it is a, it's a very you know, um, difficult decision. We're just telling you that bring the idea to the table, be open-minded about it, and, uh, and then you know, have an advisor that you trust to help guide you through it. Great. And and I've got I've got actually a real world example there that I think highlights that as well. In generation one of a family owned business, their their business was uh, manufacturing luxury yachts, and generation two was kind of up and coming in, in the leadership of the business, and they brought an idea to the table that they wanted to diversify their product offering and reach into further industries, and the idea they had was to help manufacture wind turbines and it ended up being actually a complete bust and almost took the entire company under and um the the lesson learned and they, they survived and um they actually there's there's a 
a success story in the end, but the lesson they learned is that you can't go too far out of the family business's core competency. Like when you want to diversify, it's got to be relatable and something that is in your wheelhouse and not too far off the reservation, right? So the, the, their expertise was in, in yacht manufacturing, the wind turbines, um, you know, they, they were bigger, bulkier, not quite the same shape, had to transport them. All these issues were around the business. The next idea, the, 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 that generation two got to learn that lesson and they came back with the second idea, which was a huge success. And that was completely relatable inside their wheelhouse. And that was the industry started to shift from inboard engines to outboard engines. Um, and the technology of an outboard engine for anyone that's in, in the boating world, the technology has improved those exponentially in terms of fuel efficiency, they're quieter, easier to service. The whole industry, boats with outboards on them are flying off the shelves versus uh, boats with the inboards. And Gen 2 brought this to the table. We need to diversify our product line from purely inboard luxury yachts to uh, boats that, that have these outboard engines on them. And that idea took off and was a huge success. I mean, it's it's not only increased um, their sales, but it's it's allowed them to pivot and and they're, they're back to kind of industry leadership status. One of our colleagues the other day said, focus on the head, not the tail. And I'm not sure the original attribution of that quote, but it's a great way to, great way to describe how to, to think about disrupting yourself. Terrific, thank you. So this this slide for me really was was intriguing and interesting from uh, from from the standpoint of of high quality companies and 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 I think for every family business that's out there, it, this can kind of send two messages. To, to, to kind of look internally at, at the own at your own balance sheet and, and the quality of your own company, because this is how they weathered the the, the crisis of the pandemic. And it, it from um, just this two month period of time, um, from the the credit ratings of each each of these companies of the S and P five hundred, it stair steps down pretty drastically in in their total return through those those two months. And so. Um, this bolsters our, our uh, recommendation to, you know, if you have a chance to diversify and at some point you're able to monetize um, a portion of the business in, you know, quality still matters and, and investing in, a, in high quality companies can really protect you from, from industry disruption or, you know, the, the disruption of the pandemic or any, any future crisis down the road. Um, this slide here, to me, um, is talks to diversification in, in, in another way, in, in sort of this internal diversification of increasing your product line or your service offering to to weather any, any of these potential disruptors. And this, this graph shows all those big disruption forces that came into play since the Industrial Revolution. An example that I like to to think about that spans a long period of this time was uh, Western Union. They they were they they came apart they came about as a telegraph company in the 1850s, and in 1870 they entered the money transfer business, and that was within their wheelhouse and, and a relatable business, but just different enough that when the telephone was introduced, they and telegraphs you know, really went by the wayside. People weren't communicating via telegraph anymore to people in other countries or, or business partners on the other side of the country. They, they were using the telephone and had they not uh, diversified internally, I don't think they would have survived that, that disrupting force. And so I think a lesson that they learned from the 1800s, they applied just this past November, they, they bought a 15% stake in a digital payment company for two hundred million dollars, so you know, diversification is is certainly key, and, it, and it, it's an outward-looking thing, and also an inward um, uh, part of, of your evolution and being able to adapt and 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 take advantage of 
of the opportunities. And, and if you look at the far right side of this graph, I think we're in the really early innings of how these disrupting forces are going to play out. So I think, uh, you know, looking inwardly at your own family business, you know, how, how can you use these as opportunities versus destructive uh, forces or, or something that shifts, shifts um, adversely to, to the direction you'd, you'd like to be going. A large dis, uh, disrupting force that, that family businesses uh, incur is, is the idea of, of having to pay a state tax at, at each successive generation. And we're at, an, we're at an unbelievable window of opportunity right now. If you look at the year 2021, the lifetime estate tax exemption is at $11.7 million per person. So that's you know 23 or so million per married couple. Um, that, that is a lot of value that, can, that you can exempt from a state tax. Um, probably the best, best in recent years, aside from 2010, when, when there was no estate tax, but things are going, going in a direction that is going to be less favorable in, in the not too distant future. And it, it sunsets in the year 2025 down to uh, 6 million per person. And Biden has a proposed estate tax plan out there of lowering it to 3.5 million per person. And he's also let everyone know that he'd like to increase the estate tax from 40% to 45 or 50. Um, so, you know, thinking of this as um, a disrupting force, but potentially a great opportunity, it, depending on where you are in your own family business, this past year could have been great but it could also have been a very tough year and you could have, um, you could have had very dismal cash flows, and, but that may present an opportunity to obtain a low valuation. So with that low valuation and with a certain transfer strategy, um, you could apply you know, a lack of control discount if you pass shares down to the next generation. So with all of these forces combined, it's, it's a, it's an amazing window of opportunity for, for families to transition their business. And I was just talking about the federal estate tax. You know, unfortunately, a lot of states are joining the party and charging their own version of estate tax. Um, you know, it's it, it's going to be it's going to be a headwind. It's going to be a challenge. And I, I think that uh, California is probably not far off with the way things are going about maybe charging their, their own estate tax as well. So Caleb and I wanted to present two strategies that we've been helping families navigate this estate tax burden and, and help transition um, the shares of the family business to the next generation and, and, and avoid, uh, avoid a lot of the, the, uh, the burden of this tax, but I've got a, a real world example I've been working on that's just this week with a family who received an offer for their uh, real estate property that their business operates on for $100 million. And to tie it into Caleb's earlier slides, that offer came in from Amazon. Uh, they outbid the next highest bidder by $20 million. They're just buying up real estate properties like crazy. But the property has been in the family for multiple generations, so it's very, very low basis. It's a $16 million cost basis. So not only are we thinking intergenerational transfer and avoiding estate tax, but we also have a large capital gain tax situation as well. So this, this split interest trust is you know, part of the overall strategy we're going to use with this particular family. We're not going to put the entire... Um, hundred million dollar property into the charitable remainder trust, but with through discussions with that family and learning that learning of their cash flow needs and what they needed to sustain their lifestyle, they told us that about seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year is what they currently spend and they'd be comfortable um, with with that sort of income. So we decided that a twenty million dollar parcel of that real estate could be moved in the charitable rem remainder trust and setting up a 5% annuity. So this created a million dollars of cash flow back to them that's at a tax advantaged rate. Um, once the property is donated into this charitable remainder trust, 
you can sell the appreciated property and not have to pay any capital gains tax on the sale. So you get to reinvest 100% of the proceeds into a uh, portfolio of high quality companies and uh, watch it grow and, and, and pay the, the million dollar distribution back to this married couple for, uh, for, you know, 20 years is what, what we set the trust up. And at the end of that term, the assets inside the trust will go to a charity. And in this case, it was their very own donor advised fund. So they also ha now have a, a vehicle to satisfy their charitable intentions, get the next generation involved. Um, and the cherry on the top was the very large tax deduction that they got just from the, the initial donation in year one. So that helps offset a lot of the capital gain tax that were realized on the sale, sale of the rest of the property outright. Um, so this, this is a great strategy. We, we, we use it a lot um, and it, it, it's usually one component of, of this. We usually use um, multiple strategies, but in this case, it, it worked out worked out really well. The other one that has, you know, increased in popularity and, and one that we've um, used a lot recently is this intentionally defective grantor trust. And to move shares of your family business into one of these, it, it gives you a lot of uh, wealth transfer benefits. So I, I always thought the name was kind of funny. Why would anything ever be intentionally defective? Well, it's actually very effective in one major aspect, and that's getting an asset outside of your estate. So it, it kind of frees it from ever having to get that estate tax um, uh, applied to it. So it's effective in getting it out of state. It's defective from an income tax perspective. So the grantors of the trust are still on the hook for paying income taxes on that. But even that can be looked at it as a, a wealth transfer benefit. And the way we do these for family businesses a lot of the time is with installment sales backed by a promissory note. And you can change the, um, you, you've got some flexibility around the interest rate you use on the promissory note and, and create a cash flow uh, back to yourself that's appropriate to sustain your lifestyle. So um, that's one lever that, that you, can, you can sort of toggle with and um, do what's right and, from, and what's appropriate for what, what your needs are. Um, and then at the end of the term, the, um, the assets from that sale will, will go to your, your next generation outside of the estate and bypass the estate tax. You can also, you know, apply discount to the shares that you send into this intentionally defective grant or trust if, if you send, um, if you transfer a non-controlling interest. So there's a lot of, a lot of good ways to leverage your gift and transfer to the next generation. This is the Nevada Advantage slide that, that we, you know, wanted to show you that just getting Getting assets out of California is a big is a big deal from an income tax perspective. On the graph on top, if you started if you transferred a ten million dollar asset into it into a Nevada trust over a thirty year term, there'd be about an eight million dollar tax savings, and that's just income tax alone, just from being outside of California. On the bottom, it it this graph represents what happens when you're able to avoid the estate tax um, as, as a major disruptor to the status quo and keeping your family business going. If you can move assets into a Nevada trust, um, you are not subject to California's law against perpetuities. The California law against perpetuities forces a trust to terminate around 60 years. It's 21 years after the last living person that was alive when the trust was formed. So that equates to around 60 years. And then each successive generation has to pay that estate tax. So you can see on this graph, you're getting a big chunk taken out every successive generation. But if it was moved to a Nevada trust, the law against perpetuities in Nevada is 365 years. So, you know, shares of your family business or assets can stay in this trust and compound and grow uh, exponentially. This compound growth, the ability to grow without getting um, estate tax 
has a, just a jaw dropping, staggering uh, ability to grow and, and, and be protected. So um, I'll stop there for, for now and, and open it up to any questions. Well, there there are a couple um, here, but uh, you know, uh, ha, this is a harder one, I would think. But you talked about some of those current disruptors that are sitting that are uh, sitting out there, like AI and so on. How, how do you really? How do you see those disruptors playing out now? And where do you think they'll be playing out five years from now? We have your crystal ball. Yeah, so we, we put together the slide and we were we were tempted to say, well, this is what 2020 looks like. So what does 2050 look like? And we just said it's getting too weird and too predictive to, <laughs> to see where it ultimately ends up. So we just put the Jetsons in there. Uh, but yeah, the, 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 look, so many of these slides could be an entire business school course, right? And uh, and so in, in terms of... Um, you know, the human genome, and we talked about that in the past and how long it took and how expensive it was to, to you know, replicate. And now you can do it in seconds and it's virtually free. So the, the societal impact to that, I think, is, you know, is, is underappreciated. It, it really, it's impossible to overstate how, how impactful that could be over time. Um, and, and, you know, AI is similar, right? The, the impact of AI I think we're we're only scratching the surface of how how important that could be, um, you know, from a uh, a business perspective. It's you know thinking about how how to use people and human capital versus using technology, and the the, the clear trend is that you're just going to use more and more technology, right? And the, the the people side of it doesn't mean that unemployment skyrockets and all jobs go away. We've seen over the past couple hundred years, we went from ice to refrigeration, right? And we went from producing textiles in the U.S. to not producing virtually any textiles in the U.S. Uh, and we've seen companies, you know, industries disrupted time and time again. We've seen technology, as I highlighted in the beginning, you know, completely increasing productivity and disrupting over and over again. And yet, you know, even through this pandemic, 94% of the country is employed. So... Jobs will still exist. They'll just be different jobs, uh, and AI will be a, a bigger and bigger part of our lives. Um, and the, you know, if, if anyone has seen the social dilemma, that's just the very beginning of what will happen between technology being a bigger part of our lives and then, uh, you know, human DNA being recoded over time. So. You know, David, I know that's a 30,000 foot response, but that, that's a, a question that you could spend hours and hours debriefing and talking about. One thing that we, we also included here was just the disruption in what's happening in the currency market, right? So you look at money supply, uh, you know, normally goes up a little bit in a recession, but here it's gone up dramatically over 25%. And what has that done? It's fueled speculation in terms of will the currency be disrupted, right? So you have Bitcoin, uh, and, and you know this is very, very speculative. There's so much that has to occur for Bitcoin to displace the currency, but uh, there's certainly you know a lot of speculation out there. And, uh, and, and in our view on on cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology, is that it's going to be more and more part of our daily lives over time. Uh, it's unclear. That, you know, it's not clear that Bitcoin replaces currencies, but you know, certainly cryptocurrency and blockchain technology becomes more and more ubiquitous over time. Sure. You have the uh, the reserve currency uh, slide as well. Is, we do. Is that going to change? Not in the near term, but it's a, a, a constant debate. Uh, and the, the What's interesting about this is the reserve currency is measured in centuries, right? <laughs> and we're talking about how fast things are changing on a daily, weekly, monthly level. Uh, the reserve currency is very, very slow to change. And so while the you know, M2 slide, the money supply, and the Bitcoin slide are somewhat alarming, hopefully this slide shows you that it's, it's very difficult to 
to change the reserve currency. And there are a number of reasons why, but uh, after the financial crisis, banks had to hold regulatory capital. So banks have to hold, you know, treasury bonds and, um, and it's the reserve currency of the world. So for many reasons, we believe that the, the dollar will maintain its, its status. Um, but we also put it in there, you know, as a, a potential disruption that occurs over you know, 20 years, 30 years in terms of more blockchain technology. So not, nothing for the immediate future, but something to watch over time. Okay. There was an interesting question from uh, from the audience here. Uh, given that you're talking about disruptions, uh, how are trust companies, could can they be disrupted here? And if so, how do you see the, that disruption playing out? And how's a family to choose a trust company if disruption might occur? Yeah. Um, Brian, you want to take that one? I have, I have thoughts if you want to kick it back to me on that as well. Sure. I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at that one. So I, I think that the industry is, is being greatly disrupted. And I think you know, where we view ourselves in this trust company industry, I think we're, we're almost more of an investment management company, wealth management company. Um, so when we look at the industry as a whole, we're, we're looking at, um, you know, some of the banks that have uh, a trust or fiduciary component investment management. So um, the, the disruption I, I'm thinking about is, you know, you know, the, I think the creation of an e ETF was a huge disruptor. I think um, mutual funds were created a long time ago to help people diversify. Uh, they, they wanted to diversify, but maybe their account was a million dollars and it didn't make sense to own 2,000 names in the Russell 2000 and 500 names in the S&P 500 so they could buy one share of a mutual fund and have diversification. The ETF came out and I think really disrupted the industry uh, from, from the need for mutual funds where um, there's active management um, and you're paying layered fees inside, you know, you can now own an index fund like the S&P 500 SPY and, and pay eight basis points. But um, I, think, uh, I think where I'm seeing disruption as well is, is a lot of movement in what these competitors are offering. Like, are, are you, a trust comp a trust division from a bank? Are you a brokerage firm that realizes you should also be advising on um, the estate plan? Um, yeah, you know, RIAs that that realize that there's more to think about than just uh, investing cash. And so, you know, we we we're positioned to to, to kind of have a, a one stop shop for for a family. Um, transitioning their wealth to the next generation. It's the, the five pillars of wealth management, philanthropy, family office, fiduciary and trust, investment management, and then alternative asset investing, like direct real estate, private equity, hedge funds. Um, but I'll, I'll turn it to you, Caleb, if you have additional thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. So as Brian said, we're more of a, a you know, we're a multifamily office, we're an investment firm, um, we're a trust company as well, we produce share powers. But specifically to, you know, a trust company from a fiduciary's perspective, there are sort of a, a PO box, uh, PO box trust companies, right? And then Ryan mentioned that there are, are big, you know, well, um, if, if a family is looking for someone who just has fiduciary powers and the family's ultimately going to control the rest of it, then yes, technology can disrupt that significantly. If the family is looking to carry on a legacy, right, then AI is, is not going to carry on a legacy. It's going to be, it's still going to continue to be people. It's going to be trusted advisors. And so I, I don't think that that gets disrupted, right? The the uh, you know the values that a family has and passing those values on cannot be done through a computer. It has to be done through the human element, the human touch. So I I don't think that that gets disrupted. That's well answered. Uh, so 
couple of, uh, you know, we've got just a few minutes to go, but one, one question during this conversation that arose is, is about commercial real estate, which you had, you had spoken about how families might monetize their real estate, but commercial real estate itself is, is perhaps at an inflection point, you know, will, Will people be going back to the office the way they used to? Will there be a movement out of cities to less expensive uh, living areas, for example? How, it, when you think about disruption, is that a core disruption? What's going on with commercial real estate? Is that something to be careful of as an investor or owner of commercial real estate? A absolutely, right? So the, if you look at the real estate world right now, it's bifurcated into sort of booming, very expensive projects, and then, you know, discounted with hair and risk projects, right? Uh, we, we went through a presentation on Monday for an hour on, on REITs and looking at the S&P 500, which has more than doubled in the last five years, and REITs that are up maybe a third in that time period. And the, the you know, the data center REITs that have done well, right, and, and towers have done well over five years, um, industrial has done well, but multifamily, anything that's sort of urban core high rise has not done that well. Uh, obviously anything in hospitality or, or office, um, is coming back from a, a pretty decent battering in the, uh, in 2020. So, so we do think it's, you know, sort of asset by asset, market by market and product type by product type. Um, it, it's not a, you know, broad-based, you know, now's the time to invest in commercial real estate or now's the time to avoid it. I think there's, there, there are opportunities there because there's inefficiencies that have been created and there's been just such a huge shift here. Uh, but it, you have to be selective, right? Because um, they're, you know, the core markets are, are expensive, uh, but then there's, there's some other interesting discounted assets out there. You just have to be, comfortable taking the appropriate risk there. So, um, but yeah, you know, in our view, um, office has structurally changed, but people will still want to, you know, will still get, get back to the office. It just, uh, to your point, David, it's going to be more, more growth in the second cities, right? The Asheville, Nashville's Asheville, Austin, um, Denver, Salt Lake, and then the sort of gateway cities, you know, this is this will have a prolonged negative effect on New York, San Francisco, cities like that, in our view. So. Okay. Excellent. So, any final comments uh, from either of you before we close for the day? I'll just say that hopefully there, there's a we planted a seed, of something interesting, whether it's protecting your family business from competitive disruption or whether it's from estate planning and, and asset protection uh, disruption. But there, there are many, many ways to help protect the assets that you work so hard to build over time. And, uh, and hopefully there, you know, after this presentation, there are some new considerations to, to look at. Excellent. Well, thank you uh, both. Uh, I want to thank you for, thank the audience uh, for their time and attention today. I hope they found, uh, I hope you all found this discussion educational and stimulating and maybe even a little disruptive to some thought patterns. And thank you to Brian and Caleb for your time and expertise. I think this was uh, really terrific and, and thought provoking. So I hope all of you will join us for our next webinar. Uh, you'll hear about it uh, from uh, an email from us. And in the meantime, I wish you all a good rest of your day and a really wonderful start to spring. Uh, you know, we're all starting to feel like uh, the end is in sight and the beginning is about to begin. <laughs> so um, we'll look forward to seeing you all live uh, soon enough. So thanks again. And with that, I'm going to uh, end the webcast. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Caleb.